Our next speaker is Christina Steger from the University of Utrecht, and she's going to be um, talking about iBridges, a comprehensive way of interact interfacing with iRides. Take yes. it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I would also like to introduce my two co-authors, uh, John McFarland, who is from the University of Groningen. He is in the chat um, Slack, and Tim van Dalen from Wageningen University and Research. And uh, together we have embarked on the adventure to write a GUI, a general GUI for iRoads. And um, yeah, question is, why did we do that? Um, I myself, I'm a research engineer at Utrecht University and I work together with scientists to do their data management and software engineering. And usually it's very easy to, uh, yeah, to convince researchers and uh, tell them about the advantages when they use iRODs. So um, that they can have a good overview over their data, data copies in which state data is, um, if you set up with them a metadata um, workflow or metadata scheme, um, they have all this information there. And uh, yeah, that, that is really nice. Um, However, um, when, when you then start engaging with such a project um, and you ask, uh, how shall we implement that, uh, then the, the discussions become really very technical and abstract. So then we are talking about data objects, we are talking about user-defined metadata, system metadata, how to keep it together and keep the data objects and collections ruled by IROT's rules. And um, for the researchers, that's really far away um, from their daily life. So we really needed a graphical user interface to show them the benefits of uh, iRODs, um, to help them think along with us how we could implement things. And um, also for the not so tech savvy researchers to interact with their data. Um, and we got a very strong use case from Wageninger from the Netherlands uh, Plant Ecophenotyping uh, Center. Um, that is uh, the unit Tim is working with. Um, they run huge plant experiments on fields and greenhouses. Uh, they measure a lot of things with sensors. These sensors um, come from providers and they also come with the servers where the data is gathered on. So they have no means of, um, yeah, of influencing what pre-installed software they have on the um, on the servers. So they needed a graphical user interface for their users that can be packaged and that come with all dependencies. Um, they also provide or they they yeah they produce really large amounts of data. So 500 gigabytes in a week is uh, is very feasible for them. And the data streams in continuously. So they also needed some more features in that client um, for uh, data synchronization. And I think in general, we need a graphical user interface that is supported on Windows, Mac, and Linux, because our researchers work with all three operating systems. We, of course, need to respect what is installed on the IROT server and not circumvent policies. And um, a special requirement is um, iRODS is nice as a data management platform, but there are so many other data management tools outside and we need to easily integrate with them without the necessity to always go to your iRODS um, sysadmin ask, can you have a look how you can integrate your server with the server on the other side? So we wanted to facilitate all that. Um, we came to the decision that we based iBridges on the Python client. Um, I think, yeah, we started two years ago and the Python client uh, was at that point very capable and uh, also very stable. So we decided for that. And I would quickly dive into um, how we interface with other services um, or what our requirements there are. So we want to have a lightweight integration uh, through APIs. So something actually that potentially also a scientific programmer of a research group could do and um, then hook that new workflow into our graphical user interface. So we did really a lot of effort uh, to make our code as compartmentalized and as easy to understand as possible. We also have a small tutorial how to create a new 
feature in, in the graphical user interface. And uh, when I walk you through the graphical user interface, I will show you um, an example of the electronic lab notebook server, eLab journal. And if we have time, maybe also uh, our audio transcription service at Utrecht University. Um, this is further diving into eLab journal. eLab journal is really um, made for your daily uh, lab work. So you can create a little experiment here, describe what you're doing inside of the experiment and uh, very easily um, link your, uh, your description to real world samples and also to which freezer these start samples, for example, are stored. It comes also already with presets for certain lab equipment um, that you don't have to every time manually um, write down uh, what the sensors you used or what microscopes you used and uh, with which configuration. Um, so it's really made for gathering all information at the beginning of your work. And then at Utrecht University, we have Yoda. And there's a talk uh, about Yoda by Laszlo Westerhoff um, in the afternoon. He will tell you all about Yoda. I just want to focus on one particular feature. Um, Yoda provides a data management uh, or data um, manager workflow or data steward workflow. So a researcher, no matter in which phase uh, the researcher is uh, of this project, um, can prepare a data set uh, and submit it to the vault section of Yoda. And then the data manager, a real world person, comes in, checks uh, the data for, um, for quality, checks also the metadata that is submitted, and then accepts the data for vault. And then the Yoda rules kick in to keep that data package um, secure over a long time period. Um, you can also check out that data from the preserved uh, state wherever you need it. But um, now we have these two services and how do we, do we combine them without that the researcher has to switch between uh, services all the time? That was one request. So uh, we came up with this uh, workflow. The researcher is here with this data, either that's uh, a lab server or the personal notebook, has uh, iBridges installed and has already created on the eLab journal notebook server an experiment. The researcher uploads the data to iRODS, um, notifying iRODS about this is the experiment I would like to upload my data for. And then the client uh, introduces a link in a new section in eLab journal with a link to the data where it can be found on iRODS and also labels all collections and all data objects uploaded to iRODS with uh, the experiment URL. So that's for theory. And I would like to go and show you um, the graphical user interface. Let's see where it is. Yeah. So let's take that away. I can also go there. Okay, so when you started, you're presented with a login screen. Um, if you're on a Linux system uh, and the I commands are installed, you can tell the client use the I commands because they still perform a little bit better, especially when calculating uh, diffs between source and destination um, data objects. I'm on Mac, so I don't have the I commands. Um, and then you can take your iRODS environment JSONs. We, I have several because I have several um, user accounts and also several iRODS instances, and then uh, connect to the server. It takes for me right now a little bit longer because uh, I show you really all of the features that we have implemented. So you see each feature here is an own tab. When you uh, don't need these features, uh, you simply don't configure them. Um, and in the default setting, you just get the browser and an info page that just summarizes who are you and what is available on the server. Um, coming to the browser, that's very uh, simple. Um, it directly switches to my home as I have configured it in the iRODS environment JSON as um, iRODS home. And then I can uh, browse for my data, for example, books. Oh yeah, um, let's go up again. When I click uh, on a collection, then it will give me um, the content of a collection. 
and um, if I click on a data object, you will get the first lines if it's a TXT file, a CSV, um, or a JSON document. We have added a little metadata viewer and editor, so you can add new keys, values, or units here. Um, we have a permission table, so um, I can give other people um, access. So maybe that's if I want. I'm already in one of the groups, but I can give myself explicit read access. It uses automatically the home zone. If you have another user on that IROTS instance with another zone name, then you can um, add that here. And um, you can also remove that user. Um, we have a little replica viewer where you see the full hierarchy, um, also the index of the replica and especially the status. So you can see in one go which of your replicas are okay or not, and then inform your sysadmin. Um, and also the, um, yeah, the, the checksums, they are automatically calculated when you upload uh, data. Let's go back. And um, if I want to right now upload data, I create a new collection. So I have right now demo. I go into that and I go to file upload. Let's see, I have a file here and upload it. Yeah, and you see that the uh, checksum is automatically calculated. Um, file download. Um, yeah, I have to select something and then I can download the data and it goes directly to my downloads um, folder. These buttons are just made for um, single file up and downloads. Um, if you want to upload large data, then we made a little data transfer um, view where you can basically yeah, select the demo. I just show you that you have here um, six files and then we compare it with um, what I have here in the demo. I just have one file. And it's actually the same file. I've just uploaded it. Um, so when I upload data or when I download data, um, the diffs are calculated based on the checksums of the files. And only those files um, which are different in checksum will be uploaded or updated. Yep. So let me close that. And when I click right now, upload again, then it says, well, there are no items, nothing to update because um, we have everything already here in that folder. The same works for uh, downloads. So if I would right now try to download, it would also tell me there's nothing to download. Um, we have also um, the functionality to compress data or yeah, not really compress at the moment it's tarring. So I can easily um, create a bundle. Well, it's calculated right now. Then you have that here. And now you could basically move that to another storage resource. Um, we also have the possibility to create access tokens with an expiry date. And um, now I would like to spend some time on the integration for ELAP journal. That is um, in that tab. I will quickly show you the ELAP journal experiment that I have prepared. That's here. So I have a small description and I've already uploaded some data with another client. Um, and now I would like to upload my demo data um, for that experiment, but I'm not storing it directly in ELAP journal. I'm storing it on IROTS and um, the links between uh, this experiment and uh, the data should be introduced. What you need for that is an API token. I get that from our configuration file, but you can also override it here. So we connect. The ELAP journal Python API is unfortunately pretty slow. Um, so it takes some time. I have a group and for that group, you have experiments. They are listed here. This is my experiment. And now I've um, basically captured in memory the project number and the experiment number. Now I can select my data, that's the demo. 
and um, it takes automatically your home collection to upload the data to, but you could also change that. I will upload it right now to my home collection. Now it calculates and uh, makes sure that all parts that it wants to add as metadata to the uh, IROTS data are correct and really pointing to something in eLab Journal. Now we upload it, take some wire, and then it's there. I hope you can see that. Um, so it tells me that it has uploaded the data to the home collection, and then it automatically introduces a new part if it does not exist, and that's ELN, the group number and the experiment number. If I go back, I see that right now here in my home collection. And click there, there, click there. And if I now go to the metadata, you see that uh, the data is labeled and not only the demo, but actually all of the data in that folder is labeled with the experiment URL. And if I refresh that page, you will see that a new section has appeared right now with um, some information about the data size, where it's uploaded, uh, which IRA server and which user uploaded the data. This one is a link uh, to the WebDAV server that we have configured in front of our IROT server. That is also information that is put into the configuration for iBridges. So I can open the link right now and it will bring me there. And then you have the data in your WebDAV. Um, yes, that's the little workflow. We have a similar workflow from for Emberscript. Emberscript is really a, a web server. Um, it's uh, hosted by a company um, and they offer um, audio transcriptions. So when you have an interview with someone and, and you would like to turn that into written text, you can send it to Emberscript. They will uh, transcribe it and provide you with the text. So that's what I'm doing right now. I connect. And then you see here they have glossaries. We are not going to use glossaries right now. Um, I need a WAP file. It needs to be an audio file. So that's um, our test uh, audio file. And um, or maybe I first show you, I already did something on Amberscript. So they create jobs for you. And these three jobs are done. If I submit right now this one to Amberscript, and then refresh jobs. I see that I have a new one, which is open. If I would like to preview this one right now, the job has not finished yet, but let's take one of the done ones. I can preview it. It's very, a very short um, audio file. And then I can say, um, yeah, I already have several files here, but you can say import into iRODS and then it creates that file. This is how we combine um, basically three of our uh, services um, into one graphical user interface without having to ever disturb the sysadmins. Uh, and um, we can test with that uh, really nice workflows. And if necessary, then you can come with um, some more information to your sysadmins and uh, ask them to do a better integration, maybe uh, for, info, uh, for more performance and so forth. The last thing that I want to show you is, um, oh, I have to be very quick. So it's really the, the very last thing. <laughs> and that is uh, the developer guide. When you want to create your own feature, uh, you just follow these six steps. And um, yeah, with that, I would like uh, to thank you and also the development team from three different universities, uh, three different use cases. And yeah, it's really a pleasure to work in that team. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Christina. Um, so do we have any questions from anyone in the audience? So we got a question from Justin, I guess. Uh, um, an online question. Uh, this is from John from the University of Brennigan. Um Which versions of iRod should iBridges support? 
Um, IROTS versions. Um, we actively develop uh, on three different IROTS versions because we have three different universities. Uh, we at Utrecht do IROTS version 4.2.11, uh, Groningen works with 4.2.12, and Wageningen works with 4.3.0. Okay. I also have a question. Um, what part of this presented the most challenges um, during development? Um, the the data synchronization. So uh, Jos is at the moment, Jos from uh, Wageningen University is uh, Im implementing data synchronization. And uh, previously for Linux systems, I did a workaround because IR sync is pretty easy to use and also uh, for calculating diffs. But in the Python client, we don't have that functionality. So we have to implement that really from scratch. Um, he's busy with, busy with that and also parallelizing um, these things. So not this, the, the data transfers for single files, but uh, when you're um, synchronizing files, then you have a huge list of files and that also needs to be parallelized to get most performance. So does that also mean that the data transfer tab that you, dem that you demonstrated, does that not support multiple file uploads at the same time just right now? <laughs> It does. Um, it it does, but it it when it goes through the through the file list sequentially at the moment. It puts it into an old thread, so you can use the rest of the application. But um, apart from the parallelization that the uh, Python IROTS client does, we don't do any further parallelization at the moment. But that will change um, with the next uh, version. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. And thanks, Christina. Thank you.